Investigators used publicly shared DNA data to track down the suspected Golden State killer decades after his crime spree. 72-year-old James D'Angelo appeared in court Friday, He's suspected of committing at least 12 murders, more than 50 rapes, and staging hundreds of break-ins going back to the 1970s. John Blackstone has more on how police found him. Handcuffed to a wheelchair, Joseph D'Angelo was arraigned on charges for two murders in 1978. He was barely audible answering the judge. Investigators found D'Angelo using DNA from crime scenes decades ago, which they submitted to a publicly shared genealogy website called GEDmatch. Cold case investigator Paul Holes. We were able to do this without seeking the legal authority in terms of getting the, the federal grand jury subpoena or the search warrant that we would need if we wanted to search the other types of genealogy sites. GEDmatch users submit DNA profiles they buy from sites like Ancestry.com and 23andMe. They plug their data for free into GEDmatch, searching for distant relatives. Within days, investigators found distant cousins of the suspected Golden State Killer. We literally went back to the great-great-great-grandfather with uh, individuals that were born in the, uh, the, the early part of the 1800s. It took four months to identify D'Angelo as a likely suspect, but to prove it, investigators followed him to collect his DNA from something he threw away. District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert. It could be he left a tissue. It could be that he, you know, put his hands on a door handle, but it was what I call abandoned DNA. That abandoned DNA solved a 44 year old mystery in four months, but also raises concerns about the privacy of DNA collection. Isn't it almost certain that a defense attorney is going to call this an illegal search? We would expect that. We anticipate it. We're fully prepared to deal with that uh, through the court process. GEDmatch says law enforcement never approached them. In a statement, GEDmatch tells users, if you are concerned about non-genealogical uses of your DNA, you should not upload your DNA to the database. Brooke? John Blackstone, thanks. Privacy lawyer Joel Winston joins me now from Pittsburgh uh, for more on this. So, Joel, law enforcement says they were able to link this DNA using an open source, publicly shared uh, website, GEDmatch. But the question, so first, maybe user beware if you're going to go to an open source site like that. But beyond that, for people who have used Ancestry.com or 23andMe, do we think law enforcement would have been able to dig through those databases the same way? We do not. Ancestry.com and 23andMe have much more stringent privacy protections when it comes to legal enforcement and subpoenas, as well as search warrants. Um, the open source website was essentially a Wikipedia of shared DNA and genealogy information among people who already had their DNA analyzed by one of these bigger companies, downloaded the raw data, and then uploaded it to a separate site. So law enforcement brings a search warrant to Ancestry.com and they say, no, sorry, we won't give you the info? If it is a valid search warrant that complies with the requirements of Ancestry.com, they will honor the search warrant. 23andMe has a similar policy. They state that they will strenuously re refuse any search warrant request, but ultimately, if they're legally compelled to comply, they will be required to turn over user data. So in John Blackstone's piece, we saw the defense attorneys already saying this may be an illegal search. Do we have a sense of how courts are going to rule on, on those type of questions? Um, this is a really interesting situation because essentially they use the information from the crime scene and they took the raw data and uploaded it to this open source website and used portions of the information to match it to other individuals, a so-called family match. And through that, they were able to assemble a sort of a family tree of suspects and then individually pursue those portions of the family tree that they thought were the most likely. They were looking for a male, they knew that from the DNA evidence, and then they were looking for somebody who lived in the particular geographic area where the crimes were committed. So from that, they identified a main suspect, and then they followed this individual, and they were able to recover some of his personal DNA 
that he disposed of. Uh, we're not quite sure what it is. It could possibly be um, you touch your hand on a door, you get your hair cut, uh, you sneeze and throw it away in a public garbage can. There are any number of ways that they could have acquired what is abandoned DNA from the suspect and then matched it up to the DNA from the crime scene. So this is an important point. You don't necessarily have to take a DNA test yourself if your brother or your mom or maybe even your cousin took it. It could be enough to learn something about you. And now for those of us who aren't committing murder, good, that's a good first step. But there are questions that you've outlined in the past over, could this data be used to say, to set rates for insurance? What are those concerns? There are a number of concerns around the types of entities that can access this information. Um, currently, some federal laws protect your genetic information from insurance companies and from employers as well as credit companies, uh, but it's not guaranteed in the future. The laws could change or different types of information could become known to you that you would have to turn over to these insurance companies. Uh, so realistically, the problem is that even if you protect your private information, it may be one of your family members that gives away your private information or possibly if you've taken one of these DNA test kits, you may have already given away the privacy of your great, great grandchildren. Wow. Okay, a lot to think about. Joel Winston in Pittsburgh, thanks for uh, talking us through some of it. Thank you.